If you've been asked the question, what is a brand? And what role does a brand play in business? You've come to the right place. I'm here to answer these questions for you. If you've ever asked yourself, do I need a brand to make sales in my business? Now the answers might not be what you think. Let's get to the bottom of it in today's video. In this video, we're going to cover what a brand is. Now, it's a full definition that not many people are aware of. We're also going to cover where this idea of brands and branding came from, because what was true in the 1800s is still true today. And lastly, we're going to look at what role a brand can play in your business. And we're going to look at two best in class case studies of brand management. OK, let's get into it. So. What is a brand? The short definition, the brand defines the product and company. If you look over here, a brand is not just a logo, it is the sum of perceptions of everything a company does. This covers its products, services, stakeholders. So these are people that are not employees or customers, for example, government interactions or investors, the social community, investment, charities that the uh, company is involved in employees, research and development, supply and operations. A brand covers all of these things. It's the sum of perceptions of everything a company does. On a technical level, it can be broken out into rational product or service attributes. So if, you, if it's a product, you can look and feel and touch it. What is the quality, the durability, the reliability associated with the product? And what is the price? Even the price alone gives you perceptions of you know, low price versus high or premium price tells you something about the brand. Then there are emotional product attributes. What is the image of the brand? What is the reputation of the brand and the company? What the, uh, trust does the brand give to you? And how much confidence does the brand give to you? These are things that are emotionally triggered. When you look at each of these brands, they will mean something to you in your head. There is a perception of each of these brands and therefore the company's products and services that these companies put into the market. And all of that together is what the brand is. If you want to assess your business against the marketing process to find out where you are strong and what you need to fix now, get a free marketing plan assessment template in PDF format by clicking on the link below in the description. Where did brands come from? The answer is the Victorians, the people of Great Britain in the 1800s. So the 1800s was a period of incredible development and innovation. The Industrial Revolution was in full swing. You had mass urbanization, people coming from the rural areas and the farms to work in the factories in the cities. And in this explosion of innovation, just as a quick side note, created an incredible amount of things. So here's a quick thing that during the short space of period within our history, the Victorians invented. Victorians invented Photography, the pedal bicycle, the paddle steamship, postage stamps and post boxes, the Christmas card, Morse code, rubber tires, tarmac roads, the sewing machine, the first glider flown by a pilot, the public flushing toilet, steel, safety matches, pasteurizing process, the subway slash underground trains, the typewriter, chocolate Easter eggs, mass railways, voice recordings, electric street lighting, the telephone, and my favorite, the weekend. So at this time, you had mass production and large populations living in the cities. Where previously, if you lived in a village and you wanted bread, you would go to Mr. Baker, who had his market stall in the market square. You would buy directly from him your bread. You knew him, you knew each other's families, everybody knew everybody because it was a small village. Now suddenly you have mass populations living in large industrial cities and food was being mass produced. So at this time, some unscrupulous manufacturers invoked the darker side of capitalism with a money at all costs attitude and some practices started being invoked like bulking out bread with things like sawdust so they could reduce their cost of production and sell 
more product at less cost and increase their profit. You also had examples of chalk being mixed in with ice cream and all sorts of strange things bulking out food products. Of course, there was no food standard agencies back then like there are today to regulate food and ingredients. So as a result, there were cases of poisonings, mass poisonings, and a lot of people got sick. So a lot of people uh, had a lot of anxiety about buying products. And the answer was that some clever manufacturers then decided, I will put my name on the product. I will stamp it with my name to say this is a family business. And if you buy from me and my company with my name on it, you can trust me. And this is how brands were invented. So if you look at chocolate, Cadbury's, that came from Mr. Cadbury. If you actually look at the ad, this is an ad from the 1800s. It says, finest ingredients, quality, guaranteed. So I guarantee that this is real milk cocoa and not something bad. And Sam, so you also had uh, biscuits, the Jacob Brothers. Jacob's Biscuits is very popular. Mr. Coleman made Coleman's Mustard. So everybody was putting their names on things. Now, as things developed, Mr. Lever of Unilever fame also realized, well, if we're putting this on the packaging, I could put um, something that relates to the product that people can relate in their minds that this is a, a superior product. So he called the soap Sunlight Soap. So this is the first link between branding and advertising, is associating. You're associating sunlight with soap, differentiates the soap. People think that soap is better because it reminds them of sunlight. It's cleaner. It, and, and that whole train started as well. Over time, as the market developed further, people needed to differentiate even more. So this is where made up names essentially came along. So things like Oxo Cubes, Kodak is a made up name for a camera company to stand out, but you could also trademark a name easier than Mr. Than Mr. Smith's cameras. And then you got into packaging, for example, you have Quality Street here. So how do you put innovative packaging colors with your name to stand out in the marketplace and on a shelf? So ultimately, it came down to what was good branding? It was uh, a unique name, a unique color that you owned, and ideally unique packaging. This was still in the early days, but those were the three key things. And the best embodiment of that was Coca-Cola. If you look at the Coca-Cola packaging that has been around for almost nigh on a hundred years, uh, unique name, Coca-Cola, in unique script, in a color they own, everybody knows the red, and a unique bottle. This, this bottle was recognized universally because it was used everywhere in their distribution for yeah, 60 plus years, and it was trademarked. So that's the best embodiment. It's one example of how you pull everything together in a brand and how brands evolve from just putting my name on it, you can trust me, to standing out with colors, packaging, and pulling that all together. That is where branding came from. On another side note, you might ask why the word branding was used for this type of activity. And the answer was that back in the days when farmers were getting their cows stolen, it was very hard to prove that it was your cow. Even if you caught them, you say, that's my cow, they'd be like, prove it. No, it's my cow. So the answer that farmers came up with was to actually physically brand them with a hot poker and an iron, like this poor cow here, to actually brand them with a mark and say, that is my brand, that is my mark on that cow. So when manufacturers started doing this, they used the same term to say, I am branding it with my name or my logo so that you know that it's mine. This is my product and I have my mark on it. That's what it came from. Uh, another side note, obviously they don't do this to cows today. They just have a little tag in their ear. So that's uh, good progress for you. If you are in business and recognize you need a marketing plan but have little experience in marketing, check out my website in the link in the description below to find more resources and how we can help with marketing plans. And also don't forget to subscribe, like, and turn on notifications for more content like this when it becomes available. We're now going to look at what role a brand can play in business and two best-in-class case studies of brand management. In business, a brand serves a number of purposes. The first is around its product and service that goes to the external market, and this is what most people associate with a brand. 
It's the advertising and promotion to sell more products and services. It also uses the brand for public relations, which is dealing with people like government and industry bodies, but not actually trying to sell product, just influence perceptions of the company and what they're doing. Then there's an internal space where the company deals with employee communications. So this is that, is, is the brand consistent and is the communications consistent within the company for the employees to not be confused, but also to match up externally in the top right. You can't have your advertising one thing in the marketplace and your employees are getting a different message internally. It all needs to align. The brand also plays a purpose around employees, around uh, attraction and recruitment of employees. So is it a place that people want to work? Do they want to associate themselves with that brand? Are they happy to talk to their friends and family about it when they're not at work? So it's consistent. The third area is around product and service design. This is internal as well, product and service and internal. For the same reason, you can't have the company and its resources, particularly in research and development or developing new products and services, completely misaligned to what the brand stands for. It's not going to work. So all of these things should come together under the brand vision. So it's a mistake to think that branding is just advertising and promotion, making the ads and seeing the latest ad campaign from a company or the new logo. That's not the case at all. It, co it covers what I said at the beginning. It's the sum of perceptions of everything a company does internally and externally. And when this is done correctly or done right, it all comes together under the brand vision. And the brand vision pulls and ties all of these together, as in this picture. It fits together like a jigsaw, product and services, external, internal, for the company and everything they're putting out there. And it's consistent and it just works like a machine. But all of that has to be defined is the first thing. And the second thing, you have to keep investing in the brand. As soon as you stop paying the rent or investing in the brand, it's going to start getting displaced in people's minds. Because as we said at the beginning, it's a perception. And if you stop investing in the brand, the perception either dies or it gets replaced in people's mind. So this is why companies continue to invest in brands and also try to keep it consistent. So to answer the question, what role does a brand have in business? It covers four key areas. Brands create a halo effect around the whole of the company. It builds customer preference and loyalty, supports premium pricing, enables entry into new markets, and enhances employee recruitment and retention. So let's look at four case studies across four industries. Who is doing well? We'll look at two case studies today, and we'll look at two more in the next video about branding, which is answering the question, can a brand drive business performance? In today's example, we'll look at Apple, who has a brand value now, at current times, $323 billion. So a brand value can be booked in a company's accounting statements. It can sit on the balance sheet as an asset. What that means is accountants actually value it. They have lots of metrics for doing so. And if the company either sells the company or sells the brand, that is the physical value of the brand. If you wanted to buy the Apple brand, you would have to pay, according to the valuation, $323 billion. That is what that brand is worth. And it has gone up 3,500% since 2006. If you ask, what is the link to business? Well, their share price has gone up 6,000% since 2006. Obviously, that's not all because of the brand, but the next video, Can a Brand Drive Business Performance, I'll show how there is some linkage there. You do need to have a good brand to uh, help sell products. Uh, and 6,000%, obviously $155. You could ask, well, what did they start at one cent? But no, they do stock splits over time. So um, that's why it's 155. And if I look at retail, with IKEA or IKEA, as I believe they prefer to be known, but most of the world calls it IKEA. They have a brand value of $19 billion, which has gone up 115% since 2006. So even though they're not at the same scale as Apple and they're a privately held company, as opposed to listed on a stock exchange, you can still see massive growth in the brand. Okay, so let's look at a bit more detail on each of these. So let's look at the case study of Apple. Apple's come from a design foundation, 
to product and consumer proposition. Apple computers in the 80s and 90s were about design excellence in form and function. However, they lost market share to the PC due to their business model. They didn't distribute it widely, they didn't license their software, and they were therefore relegated to these niche segments of education and graphics and videos. Nevertheless, the people who did use them uh, loved them and they built a very strong brand identity. Apple's fortunes changed when Steve Jobs recognized the coming wave of digital connectivity early and envisioned Apple being at the center of the consumer's digital life. So they understood the consumer, what the consumer wanted. The consumer wasn't bothered about the details of the specs of the latest chip on computers and things, but what they did want is put all of my music in my phone. So they merged technology with consumer needs. And on top of this, they have a very adaptive business model. So once they have the consumer, they try to surround the consumer with everything they might need. So they innovate new products all the time, but always, here's the key, with consistent brand executions. So if you look at the, the product range they've come up with, this was the original iPod music player, which then um, progressed. iPhone was, of course, a game changer around 2007. iPad was a completely new product into the marketplace. They continued to evolve their traditional computers and iMacs. They went into TV, earbuds, wireless connectivity, watches, and now, of course, they could go into whatever they want. They have such a, such a strong brand and such a strong user base and history. If, if they came up tomorrow and said, hey, Apple Glasses have launched, and there's rumors of we're launching an Apple, an Apple car, people would go and look at it. People who are in the Apple ecosystem would immediately go to an Apple store and look at it. This is one of the few companies where people queue overnight to buy the latest version of a product they already have. When the new iPhone comes out, people still camp and queue till two, three in the morning, till the next day, overnight, to get the latest version, what is essentially basically the same product. It's incredible. So the result is they're the number one brand in the world and they're the most profitable company in the world. Their stock price has surged three and a half thousand percent in 15 years. So with their brand, it's consistency and they can basically go into any product or service they want. Really, really powerful. Second case study, Ikea, who call, describe themselves as a world of inspiration for your home. The people who don't know Ikea, if you're, looking in, if you're living in a part of the world, you uh, don't have Ikea, they make what's called flat pack furniture. You, you go to the shop, you buy it, or they'll send it to you. It comes in a, like a couple of inches wide packaging. You uh, take it all out, you lay it all out, you screw it all together. It's cheap, it's sturdy, it comes from Scandinavian design, so it looks good and you can deck your whole house out, furnish it at a relatively low cost with good looking furniture. Simple functional design, start with low price target, designed for real life, self-assembly, again, takes out the cost. They have a business model that fuels growth and limits risk. They design and manufacture all the furniture themselves, they don't outsource it, they tightly control the retail experience. You have to go to an IKEA store uh, they don't have distributors and random retailers selling whoever, will, you know, if somebody puts their hand up to say, I want to sell it, that's not how it works. <clears throat> if they have a franchisee for a market, it's very, very tightly controlled. The result, even if you've never heard of them, they are the world's top furniture retailer. So from starting in one town in Sweden with one, with one man, has grown to $40 billion in revenue. So 129% improvement over 2006. 222,000 employees in 52 countries. And here's an example of the power of a brand. The brand is very well known. People, when IKEA comes to a country, people are really excited about it. On the first day of opening of the IKEA store in Hyderabad, in India in 2018, 40,000 people showed up to a company that was not in the country before because everybody just knew the brand and wanted to see it. So that is the power of a brand. You wanna to go to a new market and start building from nothing where people have never heard of you, or do you wanna build a good brand in your home market and globally, and then go into a new market and everybody already knows who you are. Fantastic, again, the power of a brand. So two different case studies of companies that are doing it well with consistency in branding and execution. So again, you look at what these two companies do and how they work, 
they've got all of this tightly buttoned up. Great advertising and promotion executed consistently in the marketplace. They're able to have good conversations with public relations. For example, if they go to India, they want to talk to the Indian government, this, the brand helps them open doors. Employee, employee communication, consistent, people want to work for these companies, and product and service design. Uh, it's easy to make new products for Apple or Ikea that's already in line with the brand. You, you, you kind of already know uh, what, they would, what the design would look like, what the color schemes would look like, etc., etc. And so, the, so are the customers. The customers are not surprised when new products come out. And all of that comes into the brand vision, which must be written down owned by you as a business owner or the senior management of the company and everybody must know it and believe it and live it for the brand vision to come alive, get into your products and services and get into the market. So, does a brand drive business performance on its own? The answer is no. A brand is an element of the overall marketing plan. It sits within the marketing plan, normally in its own section called the brand plan, but it does need to be linked to the overall marketing plan to make it work. We'll be going into the specific elements of what makes up a brand plan and the contents of a brand plan in the next video. So if you like this content again, please hit subscribe, like, turn on notifications, and we'll see you again soon.